our last two speakers, and, and I am, I'm going to kind of try to roll it because these guys are going to love talking to you. <laughs> these guys have a lot to say. I'd love to have some time for questions as well. Um, these are really juicy topics, and I think people are going to have questions for them. So I'll give you a little of the background for therapeutic drug monitoring. Well, Janice Louie is a fabulous clinician in our clinics. Where are you? Janice, are you here? I don't know. So she had the idea that we, we had cases where we were drawing levels, and we just always had these really practical questions. And, I, and she said, you know, I really want somebody, we'd love to get these answers. And I said, well, let's make a whole list, and we'll just get Chuck Paliquin, our favorite TDM guy, on the, on the phone. And then it was the same time we were doing our planning for this conference, and we said, better yet, let's just pull him in here in person. Because how many of you do therapeutic drug monitoring on a relatively regular basis? Any? OK. The MDR team, yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> and how many of you um, would do it more often if you felt like, felt a little more comfortable with when you should or how you should or how to get the results? Come on, okay, a few more, a few more. And they're uh, double hands from Bob, double hands. And you know, there are some folks around the country who do this all the time, all the time. And so, and Chuck knows that he's coming to the land of mm, sometimes <laughs> that we do it. And, and, and he's, he's a strong advocate. His lab uh, does a lot of this work for a lot of folks um, when you do send outs. Chuck is a professor, and he's the director of the Infectious Disease Pharmacokinetics Laboratory at the University of Florida in the College of Pharmacy and Emerging Pathogens. This is the site of one of our sister RTMCCs um, there in Gainesville. And uh, this is the guy who also has partnered for years with Gisela Schechter, slaving over the drug guides that are inside the survival guide. So just a, you know, a valued partner to Curry through the years, and really someone who's pretty generous with questions when we send it to him for emails. And then last night I dinner, I realized that he's also one of the like funniest. Like you just your jaw starts hurting because he's got me giggling and laughing so long. So um, uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions. Um, and he's going to walk us through what many of us find to be a confusing topic and um, convince us that maybe we should be thinking about using drug monitoring more often. Chuck. Thank you. So, so I, I won the contest. I, I won the coveted after lunch talking spot. Right. So uh, it's me against your pancreas, as your pancreas is pumping out all that insulin and your eyelids are dropping and dropping and dropping. Um, so I'm going to do things like maybe, you know, hit the, po hit the podium with the microphone, other things like that if you're uh, dozing off. Uh, so, all right. So before we start, uh, we're going to be talking about kinetics. Could everyone take out their calculator and a number two pencil, please? Oh, you're supposed to get all nervous because usually I do that, and people are like, "Oh no, I didn't know we we're going to do math." Right? You know, how many people have a checkbook? Right? Are you able to handle that? Right? Yeah. All right. So the math is about that complicated. For the things you're really going to have to do on any regular basis, you're not going to have to do you know fancy pharmacokinetic software or anything like that. Um, how many people drive a car? Ever? Not like right now, but. Ever. OK. OK. How many people, again, show me your hands. How many people drive the car without using the steering wheel? OK. That's like nobody. OK. All right. Okay. Good, good. I like, I like you guys already. You know? okay. How many people ever have been involved in the treatment of diabetic patients on insulin? OK. How many people use insulin without checking serum glucose? Nobody. Okay, because that's the way you've been trained, both how to drive and how to treat diabetes. And you can go down the list, you know. Uh, uh, warfarin, how many of you have ever been involved in the treatment of a patient with warfarin? 
How many people do that without checking the INR? Okay, you don't. Right. So, but when we come to the treatment of TB, we use these drugs. We don't check MIC values or minimal inhibitory concentrations, and we give everybody the same dose with the assumption that everyone is the patient, and that's why they get the dose. Okay, and it, it ignores the fact that for many of these drugs, especially rifampin, there is 40-fold interpatient variability in the drug exposure they get. And we can easily show, I'm going to walk you through it, it's the drug exposure that drives the efficacy of these drugs. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's a lot of slides, but you're going to have access to these slides, so I'm going to kind of go through them. Don't worry about it. You can read them over afterwards. Uh, the questions that were posed to me, I put at the end of the slide deck so you can see the questions and the answers to that. So, all right, let's just go, go going. Um, for these drugs, you could see this is the FDA approved list. There's some other drugs I'll show you. But if we're using four at a time, it's not going to take a lot of time to go through this list. You really get kind of two good shots at the patient uh, with the first line drugs and then the, the reserve drugs, if you will. Some of them are in the same category, if you will, at the injectable drugs, even though these are not the same class of drug. And then you would either give rifampin or rifapendine, but you would not give both. So we're a little bit limited uh, with what we can do. There are some other things that we can add. We can use an injectable of amikacin or canamycin type. Uh, we can give either moxifloxacin or levofloxacin, and there's not clear data, as I think Bob was alluding to, um, which one is definitely better. There isn't clinical data to show that one is definitely better than the other. Other things we might consider using include the, the macrolids or some of these other drugs. And again, Bob Horsberg went through a lot of the different trials, people trying to define the rules for that. Rifabutin is used instead of rifampin when we're trying to mitigate against drug-drug interactions. But again, we don't have tons and tons of choices. And uh, because some of them overlap as far as their mechanisms of action, if you lose one, you may lose more than uh, one of these drugs from your list. So it, it behooves us to use these drugs to their maximum benefit. And if you maximize the efficacy of the drug, you should be able to minimize the duration of the treatment. And that's really what we want to do. Right? So it begs the basic question, how do these drugs work in the first place? And molecules are generally small. Isoniazid's about 110 mass units. Rifampin's about 820 mass units, roughly. Um, so they're relatively small compared to even a single cell or even a protein like albumin, uh, which is much, much bigger than these drugs. Yet they've got to go from that tablet that you give to the patient or that capsule. They swallow it. It has to dissolve in the stomach, go through the mucosal membrane and the intestines, through the portal blood system, through the liver, out to the heart, and then through the whole body. Right? And then from there, it's got to go to the individual lesions that the patient has with the mycobacteria in it, and it has to get inside of those mycobacteria, and then it has to bind to a target inside that mycobacteria, and it has no GPS, right? So all that it's doing, it's completely stochastic. It is completely random that this happens at all, right? And as Bob was mentioning, uh, some people have more extensive lesions, and maybe the drug doesn't penetrate so well into those lesions. But unless all of that, what I just described, that whole process happens, and the drug is delivered from that tablet all the way to the patient's lesion and inside of the bug, if that pharmacokinetic process doesn't happen, then nothing happens as far as the phar pharmacodynamics or the killing of the organism. Right. So on this slide, we can see the basic description of what we're talking about. So Pharmacokinetics is, oops, sorry, let's see if I can go backwards. Yes, I can. Right. Kinetics is the movement of the drug through the body. So you give a dose, the concentrations go up and they go down. Now, if you don't like that, you can think of it farm kinetics, like the movement of a tractor on a farm, okay? So, right, <clears throat> so you know, how fast does that tractor go, you know? Um, anyway, uh, pharmacodynamics will generally produce this S-shaped curve, and there's math equations that generate that. They're called Hill equations or sigmoid Emax models. Uh, you don't have to really worry about that, but you're going to see this S-shaped curve, whereas the concentrations are really low, there's no activity, and then they go up on the steep portion of the curve, and then they reach some plateau, after which adding more drug does not give you more of whatever you're trying to get out of the drug. And if you combine those two, then you get the pharmacokinetic 
kinetics slash pharmacodynamics, which is the effect over time. And that's what we measure with, you know, how, how long it takes for somebody to become smear negative, how long does it take to become culture negative. That's exactly the dynamic that we're really looking for. So this part, the kinetics part, is really just a means to the end. It is how the drugs do what they're going to do, but this really, the kinetics per se is not what we want. We want the effect. So this gets into the details of antibiotics and how we think about susceptibility data and how it relates to how much drug we give. So you have, again, this shaded area is the area under the concentration versus time curve. You can have a MEC or an MIC in the case of antibiotics, minimum, in, minimal inhibitory concentration. And then this might be the minimal toxic concentration. So this separation between how much you need to produce the effect and how much really begins to get you into trouble, then you can work in this area and it's called the therapeutic range. Now, some of this is worked out for the TB drug. Some of it's a little bit more vague, and we have what we call normal ranges. If we gave 100 people the drug, we'd have a range of concentrations that would normally occur. And we'd be surprised how many patients actually fall below that for one or another reason. Now, I'm going to talk about the rifamycins in particular because they're the most important of the TB drugs. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about it could be extended to any of the other TB drugs, but uh, as I tell my students, rifampin is the best drug ever. Um, so I'll focus on that. And all of the drugs can be broken out into these sort of uh, categories of what's the role in therapy, what's the mechanism of action. And again, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase is in the ribosomal section of the organism. So for rifampin to work, it's got to find the bug, get inside the bug, and bind to this target. Uh, you can give the drug orally or intravenously. The current standard dose is, as Denny Mitchison once put it, the minimally effective dose of rifampin. When rifampin was developed, it was in short supply, it was hard to make, it was semi-synthetic, it was expensive, and they had thousands and thousands of patients to treat, so they gave the minimally effective dose to the maximum number of people. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to do back in the 1970s. But those facts don't attain anymore. Many generic houses make it. It's cheap. It's a very inexpensive drug. It's widely available. And we're still giving the minimally effective dose. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. So looking at the different rifamycins and how do they compare, uh, the three ones that we can use in the United States include rifampin, rifapentin, and rifibutin. And sort of the highlights of it, if you give rifampin at big doses, like 1,800 milligrams once a week intermittently, you will run into the flu-like syndrome after maybe three months. Right? Rifapentin is very highly protein-bound, and that is not necessarily a good thing in this situation. And rifibutin has a lower potential to cause cytochrome P450-based drug-drug interactions. Its toxicity profile is different. You get anterior uveitis, which may be concentration-related, and you can get uh, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia, which may be concentration-related. Now, if we line them up as far as the minimal inhibitory concentration, or MIC, the peak concentration, or Cmax, and then the ratio of the Cmax divided by the MIC, then the half-life. From this, looking at the total concentrations of the drug, you'd say rifapentine is the best drug because it has a wicked high Cmax to MIC ratio, and it hangs around for a long time. But the par part of the drug that's bound to serum albumin, which is this giant aircraft carrier of a protein, and you can have one or more rifapentines kind of hanging on to the side of it like a tugboat, right? um, that's not available to get inside of the lesions and to get inside the mycobacterial cell. It's a depot dosage form that could be used later once it unhitches from that protein, but as long as it's bound to the protein, it's doing nothing. So if we take that into account and look at just the free drug concentrations, the part not bound to albumin, suddenly rifampin doesn't look so bad. It has a substantially higher peak to MIC ratio, which is just one measure of the activity of these drugs. Um, so rifampin is still in the ball game, even though a lot of attention has been paid to rifapentine. If I had to put my money on it right now, 
the one that will ultimately win if it was a drag race is going to be rifampin. But that's just you know my personal view of it, and it doesn't mean I dislike rifapentine. It's cyclopentyl rifampin. So the business end of the molecule, the part that kills the mycobacteria, is rifampin. It just has a long side chain that sticks to proteins. Right? Right, so pharmacokinetics, or farm kinetics, as we mentioned earlier, uh, is the movement of the drug through the body. Now, we could look at any fluid, but normally we're looking at serum concentrations uh, because you know, the vast majority of the drug is going to move through the blood and then to the clearance organs, and we'll talk about what that means. So half-life is another term you're going to read in the literature or hear about uh, in package inserts, and it's really a very simple concept. It's the time that it takes for concentrations to drop by 50%. So there's truth in advertising there. And then you can have the first half-life would take you from 100% down to 50%. And then the next half-life would take you from 50% to 25% of the original amount, and so on and so forth. And it goes in, in increments of 50% from the starting point. After seven half-lives, and you can even argue after five, the drug is essentially gone. So in the case of rifampin, with uh, two-hour half-life at steady state, and isonize it, say, in a fast acetylator with a 90-minute half-life, you know, by 15 hours after the dose, the drug's gone. Right? So there's really no steady state or no buildup of these drugs with short half-lives when we give them once a day. So we don't really have to worry about accumulation for at least a, a subset of these drugs. What does that look like graphically? Well, here I put it as the logarithm of the concentration versus time. And you see how the drug goes in, and then there's a straight line of decay. And that's the beauty of making it on the log scale. A lot of biological processes become, instead of curved lines, they become straight lines. And doing curve fitting is very easy. You're just fitting uh, y equals mx plus b to this series of dots. Right? So in this case, if you give the intermittent dose of 900 or the daily dose of 300, the half-life of isoniazid stays the same. And it's pretty much gone the next day, even if they got the 900 milligram dose. Now, there's two terms you'll see in the literature. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, there's clearance and there's volume of distribution. And those are the so-called independent kinetic parameters. And people can argue just how independent they are of one another, but nevertheless, the half-life is the proportionality constant between the two of them. And the, you know, not that this is a Cialis commercial, but you know, the uh, bathtub analogy is a reasonable one for this situation. I never got that, really. You know, two people sitting outside in bathtubs separately. You know, I mean, <laughs> doesn't seem very romantic to me. You know, I mean, I've been married. 35 years, I never suggested that to my wife, you know, um, just saying, you know. Um, so uh, clearance can be thought of as the size of the drain. So if you had two bathtubs of identical size, and one of them had a, a, a drain that's the size of a quarter and the other is the size of a basketball, and you open them at the same time, well, the one with the big drain is going to be empty first. You, that's pretty intuitive. So a drug that has a high clearance is going to have a short half-life. Where is the drug going? Well, it's going out the drain, right? So where are your drains? Well, the kidneys or the liver or your drains, so to speak. So either the drug, especially if they're water-soluble drugs, like the beta-lactans, penicillin, cephalosporins, very water-soluble, you pee them out, right? Other drugs have to be metabolized first, and your, your liver has various tricks to add things or subtract things from drug molecules that make the more lipophilic drugs suddenly more hydrophilic or water-loving, and then you can pee those out too, or it'll go out in the bile. Right? Now, the volume of distribution is the size of the bathtub. So if you had two bathtubs, one very big and one very small, and they both had a quarter-size drain, and they were full, and you opened the drains, the big bathtub's going to take a longer time to drain. So this is, these concepts are very simple and straightforward once you, know, you just break them down and think about what they're, they're saying to you. So the half-life is a proportionality constant between this volume and distribution, how, how far through the body does your drug spread, and then how much access does it have to the drains. Right? So if you have a drug, let's say azithromycin or 
clofazamine or bedaquilin that goes into all the nooks and crannies in your tissue and hangs out in that tissue for a long time, then while it's hanging in your earlobe or you know in your pancreas, who has been the subject of our talk so far, um, then it's not near the liver and it's not near the kidneys and therefore it's not being cleared. And that's why drugs with big volumes of distributions have long half-lives. It just has to come back out of that tissue into the blood and then it can be cleared. So when we handle PK data, normally, and this is the kind of stuff you'll see in a package insert, we'll have the peak concentration, the trough concentration, the time that the peak concentration occurred, and then the half-life. And I've gone through most of these so far. Normally, you can do really simple kinetics. You don't have to have calculus. You don't have to have uh, you know, win non lin software. You can just do simple things, even with a handheld calculator. All right, this is a spreadsheet that I've used for years and years. I train students with it. If you can type numbers into four boxes, you too can do pharmacokinetics. Okay, all right, you know. So you think you can handle that? I mean, I know there is a decimal in there. It does make it tricky. Right? You know, it's like it's a different part of the keyboard, you know. Um, but uh, from here, you get the half, the, the elimination rate constant, the half-life, the calculated uh, maximum concentration. And we use this, you know, for the injectable drugs in particular uh, because it gives you an idea of you know, what's going on and, and whether you're not you're going to be comfortable with the dosing regimen, which is the size of the dose and the frequency of the dose that you've chosen. And maybe for some patients, you're going to need to back off. Now, the pharmacodynamics part is really the fun part of it. And there's lots and lots of data that people generally don't read. Right? Um, so there are tons of studies that are done in vitro, including the more modern hollow fiber model. So Tawanda Gumbo and George Drusano have published quite a bit on this. And we know exactly how these drugs work pharmacodynamically. Because when you put it in an in vitro model, it's one-on-one. -on -one. How many people have played basketball in your life ever? Okay. Now, if you're on a five-person team, you can kind of hide, all right? You know? But, but if you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, you got nowhere to hide, you know? I mean, they're going to posterize you, right? And somebody's going to jump over, and they're going to slam the ball through, through the hoop onto your head, right? And then everybody's going to take pictures and post it on Facebook for you, right? You know? So in these systems, there's just no hiding because it's just the bug and the drug. And we know that for almost all of the TB drugs, certainly the first-line drugs, the AUC divided by the MIC is the pharmacodynamic driver of these drugs. And it's really beyond debate at this point. And this has been recapitulated in animal models, typically mouse models, but it's gone up to macaque models and rabbit models also. And when you use the animal models, now you can add in the immune system and see what the immune system is doing along with the drug. So then it's like a two-on-one. Right? And then finally, the human clinical trials, and Bob went through a whole list of these. These are super expensive things to do, and they take years to do. So what you want to do is optimize the drug in these earlier models so that when you take the drug into the humans, you have a really good idea of what dose you want to give and what frequency you want to give, and that should be tied to the pharmacodynamic linked variable, whether it's the peak to MIC, AUC to MIC, or time above MIC. This is the whole talk on one slide. So I guess everybody's just going to go to sleep now, right? Um, but it, we're talking about probability of an event, either the desired event of the response or the undesired event of concentration-related toxicity as a function of increasing concentrations. Right? And the other thing that comes from these kinds of relationships is that you can control it. And that's never been in the vocabulary of tuberculosis. There's always been the dose, right? Isoniazid, the dose is, say it with me, 300 milligrams. Rifampin, the dose is 600 milligrams. That is such compost. No, it's not, right? No, it's not. And I'm going to show you that it's not, right? It's the convenient thing to do, and that's really the difference, right? Oh, Dr. Pelican, I don't want to think about that. It makes my brain hurt, you know? Um, okay. Uh, 
So, antibiotic terms. I already mentioned minimal inhibitory concentration. It's the concentration required. It's not optional. It's required to inhibit the growth of the organism in a particular in vitro test system. Right? So if you're below the MIC, you're below the minimum, and guess what? You're not inhibiting. In other words, the bug's still growing. It's winning, all right? You don't, you don't want that. That's bad. It's very bad. Right? Um, so in TB, we get susceptible or resistant at a so-called critical concentration. And that's a whole lecture in itself. But there's a lot of information lost when we reduce it to S and R. And we would do much better to get MICs where we'd have a spectrum of concentrations that have increasing activity. So when we look at any of those model systems that I talked about, and we're looking at the pharmacodynamics of the drug, we're either looking at the Cmax to MIC, the time above MIC, or the AUC either divided by or greater than the uh, MIC. So it's all a relation of exposure of drug, either the value itself or a time unit, relative to that MIC. And you really want to stay above that MIC by some multiple, at least at the peak concentration. So this is what it looks like. It's a recapitulation of those slides I showed you earlier. Um, but again, we have the AUC, which is this gray line. We have the in vitro MIC, because you can't measure that in people. Right? And then you have the relationship. So this peak to MIC is 3, and uh, or I'm sorry, is 9. And then the MIC value is 3. Um, and then the relationship is 3, 9 divided by 3. And then the time above the MIC is about 8 hours. And then I could calculate, but I'm not showing here, the AUC to MIC. Looking at isoniazid as a classic example, and there's fast acetylators, people that clear the drug rapidly because they have a lot of that enzyme and acetyltransferase too. And there are slow acetylators that lack that enzyme and so it hangs around longer. But even in the slow acetylator, the concentrations are not super high. And the drug falls below the MIC somewhere around 16 hours post-dose, even though the MIC is only around 0.1 micrograms per mil. It falls faster in a fast acetylator, which kind of makes sense. That's why they call them fast. Right? Now, if we look at ethionamide, everyone's favorite drug. There's a lot of talk of nausea and vomiting earlier. Um, so the kinetics are not that dis distant from what we saw with isoniazid. The difference is the MIC is anywhere between 10 and 100 times higher. Right? So if this were isoniazid, isoniazid would be the second line drug. And if this was ethionamide, even with the pucogenic potential of the drug, ethionamide would be the front line drug. And it's because of the dynamics. It's not because isoniazid has a cooler spelling and has a Z in it. It's because the MIC is so low. And if we have another drug, even if it's as pukey as ethionamide, if its MIC could be made an order of magnitude or two lower, this would be a first-line drug. There's actually people working on that right now to give another compound with ethionamide that causes the effective MIC to drop dramatically. So stay tuned for that. So the pharmacodynamics is the killing of TB, you know, by most of these drugs, as mentioned earlier, can be related to the AUC to MIC. And that's extremely powerful information. Now, I had suggested a couple of readings for you, and I know you didn't all have a chance to do it. Uh, but one of them was the supplement to the guidelines. Payam Nahid was the head of the chair, the, the chair of the guidelines committee, and he asked me to work on the pharmacology section, and so he had to deal with all my ranting and raving, you know, sending him emails that would wait for him in the morning, you know. It's like, you know, Payam, I was reading that section last night, and you know, that just came from somebody sigmoid colon, right? You know, you know, they just made that up, man. There's no data to support that. So um, the the guidelines are different now, and there's a lot more emphasis on and the PD because there are more data about that and then you can think about that. The other paper was the paper with Susan Borman as the first author, which was the TBTC trials 29 and 29X. 
And if you haven't read that paper, I strongly recommend that you read the paper. And there's a second paper that's come out with Rada Savic as the first author, which gets into the details of the PKPD. But the punchline, and I'll show a little bit on that paper later, the punchline from that study is that in 29X they gave 600 versus 900 versus 1200 milligrams of rifapentine. And at the end of the trial, all three arms looked identical as far as outcome. Oops. All right, so that's like, that's the major, major drag if you were the principal investigator. You did this big trial and you got nothing, all right? But wait, there's more. So once we looked at the exposure of the patients in the, the, that study, there were some people who only got a 600 milligram dose, but they absorbed all of it and they had high concentrations. And there were people with 1200 milligram doses that didn't absorb it, despite the size of the dose, and they had low concentrations. So when you stratified based on the area under the curve, you could predict who was going to be cured and who wasn't. So that's why you need to read those papers. Right? And you can do this at home now, okay? Because you can control the drug exposure in any of your patients anytime you want. So concentration-dependent killing, what does that mean? More is better is what it means, okay? So the aminoglycosides, how, so there's at least one person who's as old as me in this room. Not many, but there's at least one person. And so the, the people who are old enough to remember how gentamicin and tobramycin used to be dosed, 80 milligrams every eight hours, anybody remember that? Yeah, right, more than two people, okay, right? Do we do that anymore? No. We give like 400 milligrams once a day. We give seven milligrams per kilogram once a day because the dynamics of the drug were discovered to be AUC and peak driven. So big doses less often are better for a number of reasons that I won't elaborate on. Well, it's true of the fluoroquinolones and, and Dr. Horsberg talked about the OptiQ study of high dose levofloxacin, right? So those drugs have concentration dependent killing and then rifamycins are the all-time champion, and, and rifampin in particular, the maximally effective dose of rifampin has never been discovered in any model. You get into toxicity at like 1,000 milligrams per kilogram before you, you plateau on the efficacy curve. So here is a study from 1969. I was 10 years old, right? um, And this was a study done by Ludover Bist in Belgium. And he gave increasing doses, and these animals are inbred mice, okay? So they're all essentially, they're not clones of one another, but they're extremely close. Um, and in the different groups, you can see, you know, there's a big load of 1 times 10 to the eighth, I believe, organisms at the start. And then at 10 weeks, he culled the animals and, and plated um, their lungs and spleens to look at how many organisms were left in those organs. And you could see if he gave five mix was a lot of bugs left, right? There's 10, that's the standard dose that we give. Still plenty of bugs left. But if you went up to 40 milligrams per kilogram, if you had the intestinal fortitude to go that high, you could drive the population to zero, at least under these test conditions. Oh, it's one of those fancy slides that I got a page through. Bear with me. Okay, so this is another study. This was a six-day acute uh, model by J.R.M. and all at the AstraZeneca labs in Bangalore, India. And the punchline here is that this is the concentration response. There's AUC divided by MIC and the drop in the, in the number of organisms. And you can see that if you give big enough dose, you can really drive the, the organisms way towards zero. Way up here at the very top where it's just starting to show activity, that's the current 600 milligram dose. That's what Denny Mitchison was talking about when he said, this is the minimally effective dose of rifampin, and we still use it. That's not exactly fashion forward now, is it? You know, so. so again, that slide that I just showed you is this slide rotated 90 degrees to the right. Okay? So instead of going up like this, the other one kind of started here and dropped down. But it's really the same kind of response curve. So if we start looking at rifamycins in humans, this is uh, one of several trials, like this was the study that was actually done in England by the British Thoracic Association. 
and it's this is our standard regimen, right? And it didn't really matter if you gave streptomycin or ethambutol as the fourth drug. You get about 77% of the patients that are culture negative at two months, and then by three months, the vast majority of them are culture negative. Look at the doses here. That's 35 megs per keg of pyrazinamide. How many people give 35 megs per keg of pyrazinamide? Nobody. Why are you expecting these results then? It's a concentration dependent drug. Ethambutol was 25 megs per keg. How many people give 25 megs per keg of ethambutol? Well, that's concentration dependent. So if you cut the concentrations, you're cutting the efficacy. And this was the thing that I was ranting about, the PIAM. There were so many things in the guidelines that, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, you know, in previous iterations of the panels, there was like strong personalities that said, in my famous clinic, I do it this way. And everybody else said, okay, we'll put that in the guidelines, right? Well, that's not exactly a prospective randomized cl clinical trial, is it? And if you look at going back from the 1980s to the 2003 guidelines, the doses of many drugs dropped with no new data to support it. It's just somebody felt uncomfortable with the dose. And the idea behind doing that is that you're thinking that toxicity is concentration related, but efficacy happens by magic, all right? <clears throat> and it's actually, in most cases, the toxicity is idiosyncratic. You either get it or you don't. You either get a rash or you don't. It has nothing to do with the concentration, but the efficacy is absolutely tied to the exposure of the drug. Right? Oops. Right. So here is a study that was done by Christ and Perte in Paris. They gave 900 milligrams of, of isoniazid and 1,200 of, of rifampin, and they gave it either daily or every other day, and then everybody got streptomycin daily. Right? So there was sort of a streptomycin daily backbone to either of these regimens. And these are the kind of numbers that they got, which is kind of interesting. And this is 1976. Right? And if we just put those two studies side by side, which is not statistically valid, but it just allows you to see that it kind of looks like if you double the dose, you move everything up by about a month, right? which, is, which is very good. So I presented these data at the TBTC meeting in 2002. I presented it uh, at a Gordon conference in 2001. But certainly at the TBTC meeting, it, after I gave this talk, I looked around and it looked like, in the faces of some people, I just shot their dog, right? You know, it's like, here, Lassie, bang, you know? And it's like, you offended the perfect dose. Don't you know it's in the guidelines, you know? Um, and it's like, yeah, I know it's in the guidelines, and it's still wrong, OK? Um, so now this study has been done, and I'll show you some uh, data. It's been redone, I should say. Right. Oh, by the way, they didn't get the flu-like syndrome. And normally, you don't get that till about three months out, right? And um, you know, even. With all the, the shortcomings of this original trial, there was enough data there for us to go back to the NIH and, and, and get funding to do a clinical trial, which is now done in Peru. And then our colleagues have been doing study in Tanzania and South Africa. And they're up to 50 milligrams per kilogram. So in somebody my size, that's 4,000 milligrams of rifampin. And guess what? It works better. Like, Shocking, but true. It's better, er, right? Okay, and why? Because you know we're down here on the dose response activity of rifampin at 600 milligrams, and we need to get up here. And the only way to do that is give more of it, right? And it's cheap, right? So here's a study we did with the TBTC, published back in in 2005. So this data are not new, and you'd be surprised how many people, including co-investigators that argued with me and others about the data for like years after the fact. And it's like, it's your study for crying out loud. You know, it's like, it's like blame yourself. You know, that don't, don't shoot the messenger, right? Um, so what did we learn? It, we learned that if you get low exposure to rifibutin, especially this study was giving it three times a week. If you have low exposure to rifibutin, that is bad, bad.
Okay, because not only did you have failures or relapses, but you did so with acquired rifamycin resistance. So this is a CDC-sponsored study, and there were at least uh, six, I think a total of eight, but we were able to do PK on six of those eight patients who had acquired rifamycin resistance. So that's like, how many people have seen the Peter Pan movie with Robin Williams, you know, a hook? Bad foam, PETA, bad foam. The CDC is out there generating rifamycin resistance. How embarrassing. Oh, All right. So, but the, the point here is that the AUC was, you know, substantially higher in the patients who were in the blue box, the happy guys that were cured, than in the red box, except for this one guy, right? So it just shows, again, there's a certain amount of, uh, stochastic behavior or randomness. This guy had plenty of rifibutin, but something else led to him having failure and relapse. And then these guys got away with it. They had low concentrations, got away with it. But now there's at least a dozen cases in the literature of rifamycin-resistant TB being selected during the course of rifibutin treatment, typically in an HIV-positive patient. Right? And the point here is if you look at uh, Susan Mark's paper from the CDC, if you had drug susceptible TB, it costs about $17,000 a year to treat on average across the US. If you have now a case of acquired rifamycin resistance, which is for all intents and purposes MDR TB, that's on average $133,000. Right? The serum concentrations for a pair of rifibutin concentrations is 140 bucks. It's 140 bucks, 133,000. Hmm. I think you could do a lot of TDM for 133,000 dollars. Just saying. Right. Okay, so this study proves exactly what Ludo Verbist showed in his study. If you don't have a lot of rifibutin, in the case, you know, substituting for rifampin, you're going to end up with a lot of organisms at the end of the day, and that's not where you want to be. Okay. So rifampin, the PD, is clearly linked to the AUC to MIC, and to somewhat slightly less degree, the peak to MIC ratio. And it is not linked to time above MIC. What does rifapentine give you? More time above MIC. So rifapentine actually optimizes the parameter that is not linked to the pharmacodynamics of the drug. That's why I'm not so bullish on rifapentine. It seems to be optimizing the wrong thing. Right? So here's the study by Martin Borey that I mentioned uh, briefly before. This is the one that's in Tanzania and South Africa. This part is a Croy uh, paper, and you can see that you get more than a doubling of the AUC with a doubling of the dose. So just going from 10 to 20, this goes up more than double, and this goes up more than double. So this is like a BOGO, you know, buy one, get one free. You know, this is like the blue light special, right? And, and so as you increase the rifampin dose, the kinetics get prolonged, and it becomes to behave more like rifapentine as far as the long half-life part. The absorption phase gets extended, I should say. And it gives you these disproportionately high AUC, and that's your friend because that's your pharmacodynamically linked variable, right? So this is a bit busy slide, but the bottom line is that these are the doses that they gave in this published paper, which I refer you to. They've gone on now to 40 and up to 50 milligrams per kilogram, but even at a 70 kilogram person, which is a little bit smaller to me, that would be at the higher dose, 2,400 milligrams. 50 megs per keg in somebody my size would be 4,000 milligrams. Right? And I've already mentioned the more than proportional increase in the concentrations. Here's the other point that they made. There was high interpatient variability. Again, about 40-fold variability across the population. So just giving the higher dose doesn't tell you you're going to get the exposure that you want. It gives you a probability of that, but it doesn't give you that higher exposure. And then if we turn to that rifapentine paper by Susan Dorman, the same thing, right? So what uh, was found in uh, TBTC trial 29X, high rifapentine exposures were associated with high levels of sputum sterilization. I think that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Right? We're trying to kill the bugs. We're really not trying to negotiate with them, right? We're not trying to talk them out of it. We're trying to kill them, right? You know, so just get her done, right? You know, um, <clears throat> right? So 
less proportional increases. This is the tricky part of rifapentine. It's a very fat-soluble drug. And it's best given with food, unlike rifampin. And as you increase the, do the dose, with each increment of dose increase, a smaller percentage of the, the next increase is absorbed. And that's the opposite of rifampin. That's another reason why I think rifampin will ultimately win the battle, the playoff here. You know, So where does the, all this data come from? And you have to take my word for it. No, you don't. So the, the people that had published this stuff before I even got in the game, there was lots of stuff out there. I started in, in 88 in Denver, started publishing around 91 on this. This is a paper from the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development. You can get it online. It's free. It's got like a two-pager on each of the TB drugs. If you don't already have that, get it. It's really good. Highly recommend it. Uh, if I can get this to work. Oh, OK. So I've already mentioned that the drug has to find the bug and bind to its target, or else nothing's going to happen. It's kind of like gravity. you know. It's like I could take this and drop it and prove that gravity is still working. Or as I like to say, Gravity, it's not just a good idea, it's the law, right? <clears throat> Malabsorption is a problem. And it's almost impossible to predict, just looking at a patient, who's going to be a poor absorber of any particular TB drug. And if there was a clue to it, I would tell you, but there isn't. And it's just like, as, as Bob Horsberg was mentioning, we can't tell you who's going to fail or who's going to do well at the start of treatment, because there's no biomarker for that that we're aware of right now. And absorption is the same thing. And each drug is absorbed separately. So knowing one doesn't predict what's going to happen uh, with the other. So your question is, if you, you know, give the standard dose and just hope for good things to happen, or you can look under the hood and see what's going on. Right. Slow responses to TB treatment are common. And I'll show you on the next slide. And then some of these are due to you know, interruptions. And you guys can tell me all the excuses why people drop out of therapy. All right? Well, I have a drug habit, and I have to go take care of it. You know? um, and people get toxicities, and so on and so forth. So there's good reasons why there's treatment interruptions. But here's the slide. Now, a lot of people have already mentioned that magic 95% effective, including my friend Bob. All right? But I'm going to question that. Is the regimen that we give really, really, really 95% effective? Well, if you look at the BMRC studies that were done, yes, with the caveat that if you read those papers carefully, those were all per protocol analyses. What does that mean? Well, there's about 10% of the patients who could have been in the study, but they declined to be enrolled. So those people were not analyzed. And then there's about 10% of the people who had protocol violations. So they were excluded from the analysis. So now you're only at 80% of the original population. And in that 80% of the original population, then the regimens were approximately 95% effective. But those other 20%, well, those guys are still in your clinic, right? You, know, you can't say, well, you're not going to be in my clinic anymore. No, they're in your clinic, right? So that 95%, when you put it into sort of practical numbers, is really more like a 75%. Now, you might say, well, that's an overly pessimistic number, Chuck. Well, maybe, but let's look at this. This is from the annual CDC slide set. And every year, they produce this, right? And overall, it's in the 90s. It's in the low 90s here as far as completed treatment. There's no cure or failure in the CDC collection of data because we don't follow people out for 18 months to see if they were cured or relapsed. Right? So they, they either completed therapy or they didn't. But even here in the dark, the darker bars, it goes up to 88%. So at least as of this data set, 88% of patients completed therapy in one year or less. That's not six months. So I asked Tom Navin and his group, and they were like Johnny on the spot. They answered me within like 36 hours. So oh, just so you can see the small print, basically these are people who would otherwise be eligible for short course therapy or six month therapy. If they were a pediatric patient or they had rifampin resistance, those were excluded. But you can see it in the CDC slide set anytime you want. So you know the standard claim is that 98% success followed with 3% relapse for 95%. That's quoted in all these textbooks. So I asked them, well, really? Is that really true? What percentage of TB patients complete their six-month regimen in six months? You want to guess? 
pick a number. It's going to be 88% or less, right? 50. Do I hear 60? Do I hear 60? Do I hear 65? Oh, good. Right. Yeah, it's like, and the answer is 18%. That's, I get that reaction every time. Like, holy shish kebab, right? You know, 18%. Now, you might say, well, Chuck, that's not really fair because, you know, the patient was in the county hospital and they had to get transferred to the TB control group, and, you know, there's paperwork to be... Okay, fine, seven months. Okay, I'll give you a month to do paperwork. All right? Forty-five percent, okay? And these are the CDC's data. Now, sir, you need to go back and tell your boys to put this slide in the annual sites that right after the other slide, right? Because everybody keeps saying this thing is 95% effective, even though the slide before said it's only 88% effective. And it certainly ain't at six months, right? Because there's the 88% at 12 months, as advertised on the previous slide, right? So this is what we've got. So if you go around quoting our regimen is super great the way we're doing it right now, no, it's not. We are lying to ourselves to make ourselves feel good. All right. It's almost as good as getting more pay, but not quite. Right. You know. So remember, this is supposed to be a six-month short course regimen, and you're paying for every month. So if you're paying for 12 months instead of six, you paid for it twice, right? I mean, that's like pretty straightforward math. I did that without a calculator. I just wanted you to know. Right? <clears throat> So in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. All right. All right. Now, the other thing that I love to get into here, in the BMRC studies, they were done in Hong Kong and East Africa in the 1970s. The average, 80% of the patients were male, and the average weight was around 110 pounds. Right. 48 kilograms. And so this was the dose. 600 of rifampin in a guy that big is 12.5 megs per keg. That's a good dose. But if you get somebody who weighs 90 kilograms, and anybody see any patients that big now? All right. All right. You know, so you cut the dose basically in half. It used to be that consumption meant that the disease was consuming you. Now consumption means your patient has found Krispy Kreme. Okay. Um, so it's just a whole different ball game. And we're still giving the doses that we're giving. 40 plus years ago, the people were half the size. Oh, what could go wrong? Okay, this could go wrong. Okay, if you weigh 48 kilograms, hey, you're full, right? If you weigh twice that much, guess what? You're half full or half empty. Or maybe you like cars better, okay? Right? Imagine 10 gallons of gas, full. 10 gallons of gas in a manly Chevy Avalanche. Oh, you're only a third full, okay? All right. So here is the dose that we're giving, and this is where we are at the top of the dose response curve. And that's why our regimen is not getting any better. And if anything, it seems like we're losing a little bit of ground, and now we're getting anywhere up to a half a million or certainly 400,000 cases of MDR-TB out there, 10% of which approximately have XDR-TB. Well, clearly, we're losing, okay? This is like the New England Patriots with three minutes left to go <laughs> in the third quarter against Atlanta. They were losing. They were losing badly, all right? But they have Tom freaking Brady, all right? <laughs> and we have Refampin. Okay, Brady, Rufampin, very similar, right? And so you listen for that sound of, what's that sound? That's the sound of someone opening a can of whoop ass, right? <laughs> you know? So just like Tom freaking Brady, if we adjust the doses of Rufampin, we can open a can of whoop ass, right? So therapeutic drug monitoring aims to promote optimal therapy by putting concentrations either in a normal range or in a therapeutic range. It's most useful if there's a relationship, and I've showed you some of that data, there is a relationship between the drug exposure and the outcomes that you're going to get. 
And then when the serum concentrations can serve as a surrogate for the concentrations of the site of action. Where's the site of action? Usually it's in a lesion in somebody's lung, right? Now, if you're brave enough and you have a 14 gauge needle, you could go in there and get a sample, okay? Your IRB might not approve that, uh, but you could physically do it. But we generally don't do that because there's problems like collapsed lungs and bleeding and things like that. So we normally rely on serum concentrations because after all the lungs are the biggest capillary bed in the body and if it's in the blood it's almost certainly in the lungs and that's a reasonable assumption. And it's important when there's a narrow range of concentrations that are safe and effective and when toxicity or lack of effectiveness puts the patient at great risk. And I talked about acquired rifamycin resistance and what that means and it's $133,000 a pop on average, plus that patient is coughing now, these organisms that are drug resistant. So you can have the, the potential to propagate drug resistance in your population. So I would say that puts the patient at great risk. Right? And then finally, you don't treat numbers, you treat patients. So you're treating in conjunction with everything else you know about that patient. And by using concentrations, you can decide how aggressive you're going to be. Now, if you have a 22-year-old who's otherwise healthy and he's doing great, you might elect not to check the concentrations, or you might check them early and say, all right, you know, I'm not going to have to push too hard because the guy's already doing well. But you may have other patients who are on the border of going into the intensive care unit. They've got hemoptysis. They've been losing weight. They're not gaining any weight. And those are patients where if you don't turn the corner pretty soon, they're going to croak. Right? So you may want to be very aggressive in those people, and by using concentrations, you can. Right? If you're very uncomfortable with all these concepts, you can get this book. I have nothing to do with the book. I don't get any royalties from the book, nothing. Um, but this book is great because the chapters are three pages long. It's 14 font, and it's got pictures. All right? you know? No scratch and sniff, no. No scratch and sniff. All right? you know, so... Um, so, and here's my colleague from Los Angeles, Roger Jellif, who he and Mike Neely just published a book on individualized therapy, but this paper goes back to 2000, goal-oriented uh, model-based drug regimens, individualizing. We hear a lot about precision medicine, but we don't apply that to tuberculosis. Everyone's an individual, just like everyone else, right? So, in TB, um, we, we give everybody the standard dose. But Roger would say, well, therapeutic concentrations vary by patient in the examples I just gave, people that are doing great, people that are not. And you don't choose a dose, you choose a serum concentration goal, and you achieve it with the greatest precision possible. So in other words, if you're relying on the drugs to cure the patient, any surgeons here? Okay, so chance to cut is a chance to cure. Heal with steel, right? But with the exception of our one surgeon, you guys can't do that. Okay, you guys have to use the drugs, so you may as well use them smart, right? So, if you're going to use these drugs, wouldn't it be nice if you're going to embark on six to 24 months, depending on acceptable or drug resistant, that you give the right amount? What a concept, right? Now, people go, well, I don't, let me think about that. Okay, let's say you get paid $100 a week, okay? And then at the end of the week, your boss gives you 75 are you going to notice? Yeah, you're going to notice. You can say, hey, bud, where's the other $25, right? So for some of your patients, you're just grossly underdosing them, but you don't know because you didn't check anything, right? So again, what we want to do is push people up the dose response curve as much as possible without running into this concentration-related toxicity, which happens for select drugs like ethambutol and cycloserine, but perhaps not for other drugs like rifampin, right? Normally, we use a two-hour and a six-hour post-dose concentration. Two concentrations are definitely better than one because you can get a pattern and you can actually do calculations if you wish. And you can see patterns like this. So here it's two concentrations in a uh, TB patient without HIV. And this is an ACTG study. Oops, look at what's happening with rifampin in the AIDS patients. Bummer, dude. Their concentrations are about half. So the drug is just dribbling in. Could that be a problem? Yes. Right. Now, people say, well, you know, there's no prospective randomized trial of therapeutic drug monitoring, and that's true. But there's a lot of data now on the PKPD of these drugs, and we're just extending that to the individual patient. So the decision to use this is the same as any other test, right? Now, if you get a CBC with differential or a CAT scan or an MRI, 
That doesn't guarantee the outcome of your patient, but you're doing that so you can look inside your patient without cutting them open. I know, not to try to take any business away from you, right? But, um, you know, normally you get a CAT scan so you can see what's going on in the lungs without cutting the lungs open, right? And you get a CBC with diff to see if they have enough red cells or white cells in the blood without having, like, to take out their spleen or their liver or other organ, to, you know, through the whole count. Right? So they don't guarantee the outcomes, but that gives you information to make clinical decisions. So TDM allows you to individualize the therapy. You can optimize any of those parameters I talked about. You can shorten treatment. If we're already talking about 88% patients being completed in therapy at 12 months, we have some room to go just to get back to a six-month regimen. Right? It can allow you to unravel complicated drug-drug interactions. And in the end, I would say knowing what's going on in your patient is better than guessing. So now, here are the questions that were sent to me, and we'll just walk through them. Okay? In what population should you use TDM? Well, any patient you wish to control drug exposure. It's that simple. Right? You can either give them the standard dose and hope that they're absorbing the drug the way you want it, or you can find out and play dial a dose. So it's, if you want to control the therapy, this is how you control the therapy. There's no stethoscope that's sensitive enough to hear the rifampin molecules go by in the antecubital fossa. I'm sorry. You know? right. Now, how much does it cost? If you get just a single test for a single drug, it's $80 in our laboratory. There's other laboratories you can use. I always recommend two and six hour concentrations. Rifabutin, it's three and seven because it's more slowly absorbed. Rifapenthine is a separate story. So what we do is to incentivize people to get the more information as we drop the, the price from 80 to 70 each. So it's a $20 discount in our lab. And then the shipping costs vary depending on, you know, whether you're driving it over from Jacksonville <laughs> to Gainesville or you have to ship it, you know, from the Northwest or something. Right? What's it like? Well, it's the same as drawing a chem panel. It's a plain red top tube, right? So if you draw a chem panel, the only tricky part is you need to observe the dose and write down the time, and then write down the time of the two blood draws. But other than that, it's the same as a chem panel. You centrifuge it, harvest the serum, freeze it. Several labs offer testing. I said, where can it be done? Two labs offer most of the tests you might want, and one lab uh, has PK consultations. So in our lab, you know, you, you can email me, you can call me on the phone, I'll tell you what I think. And lots of people in the room, and certainly others not here, we do this all the time. It really varies, you know, all of you sends us samples all the time. Texas Center for Infectious Disease sends us samples all the time. Uh, lots of places around the country. It really varies. Some never do, some always do, and there's a lot of places in between. INH is not the most stable stuff, so normally you want to centrifuge it and freeze it within an hour. Well, that may not be possible, so what can you do? If you get it in a green top tube, which is good for everything except the injectable drugs, you can collect it in a green top tube, invert it, it's heparin, it's not going to clot, you can immediately put it on ice chips. So you can have one of those little coolers, like the little Oscar coolers, and a styrofoam cup with ice chips, and it's going to be stable. So you can just, you know, finish seeing all your uh, directly observed therapy patients and then bring it back to the lab when you're done your rounds. Just keep it cool. Can rifampin be used as a surrogate for INH? No. Each drug is absorbed completely independently. Sorry, that's just the way they are. They're all unique chemicals and your body handles them all independently. Right? Uh, you can have good absorption of one and bad of the other. Should we use another surrogate or marker like posiconazole? Posiconazole is really poorly absorbed. Don't use it as a surrogate for anything. Okay, um, we can measure posiconazole, but you know that's a that's a whole other talk. Right? So at any rate, each drug is absorbed independently. What about diabetic patients? Well, as a general population, they appear to have lower serum concentrations. And if you want to read more about it, here's a paper just published by uh, Eric Halt and Scott Hazel and Company from Virginia. Um, just this year, and early interventions for diabetes related tuberculosis associated with hastened sputum microbiological clearance in Virginia. So they do TDM all the time in their patients, and it makes a difference. 
Okay, so I'd like to thank uh, Eric Nuremberger and Bill Berman. I've uh, poached some of their slides and I've uh, worked with them for many, many years. And the people who actually do the tests in the laboratory, TJ Zagurski, Kumi Kim, Roger Jellif is our, or excuse me, Roger Sedlicek is our office guy, uh, Emily Graham and Yaz Horita. Uh, there's our web link. And look at that, orange and blue, go Gators. Thank you very much. Let's take some. Uh, let's take some questions. I, and don't be. Ch I know you guys have questions. On this. They're stunned. I know. Come on down. He line up to a mic. I, you know, I, I'm going to do something really basic. So this is this is my gut reaction. And I know I've sat down with Chris, and we've gotten these results back, and it's and then it's it's too low, and then we up the dose, and the next one we get back. Still way too low, and then we start up in the dose till we get scared. And I know that when you, when we did the last drug guide, you made sure that we did not say that there was a max dose. Right. So help me get over this fear factor. The dose is just a convenience. Uh, packaging, right? So the drug company has to put it into something, and they have to decide the size that they can reproduce, right? So that's why you get either a 100 milligram tablet of isoniazid or a 300 milligram tablet of isoniazid, um, and it's just the convenient packaging, right? And then they have to get it through a regulatory agency, and then there it is. And then the drug companies hate therapeutic drug monitoring. Even for the new drugs where it's obvious they need to do it, right? Because they want the dose. But the answer I always give to them is like, well, am I going to treat the patient, all right? No, I'm going to treat lots of patients. And if you just think about the people who walk through your clinic, are they all the same age and all the same height and they all have the same renal function? No, they're all different. Why would you think they're all going to take the dose? It's not... It's not a reasonable expectation. It's just been in the guidelines because it's convenient, right? So when I have to think about, like you said, some drugs, it's just a, a very individual response to toxicity. So it doesn't matter if I have a, the standard dose or a higher dose. You know, someone's going to get their toxicity. But should we be really looking at our TB drugs? These are really concentration dependent. And so I'm, even though I've got a triple the dose, that I shouldn't be worried about toxicity because it's concentration dependent. So it's just like, you know, the person who gets the starter set of INH, mm -hmm. you know, some of them are going to get side effects, they're going to bump their AST, right? But if the concentration, the drug concentration is low, I could triple, quadruple that dose till it gets to the therapeutic range and that I'm not somehow uh, getting close to the toxic range because it really is concentration dependent for toxicity? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. if you're giving a patient uh, a drug and, and they get really low exposure to the drug, where'd the rest of the drug go? It just went out the other end. Okay? They never absorbed it, right? So you have, you know, therapeutic concentrations in their stool, but unless they have stool TB, which most people don't, then, then you're not really treating them, right? It's just going out into the toilet, right? So it's only the part that actually gets absorbed and past their liver and into the systemic circulation that even has a chance to get into the lesions, right? Mm -hmm. So the amount that you put in the mouth makes no difference. It's just the convenience factor of, like, I can count X number of tablets to come up with a dose. And you have to start a dose, so you'll start with the guideline dose. And the guideline dose could change over time. The rifampin dose is going to change. We could already just move to 1,200 right now. About a half of the patients that we do rifampin concentration monitoring on end up on 1,200 milligrams because they're big, just like you know that Chevy Avalanche I showed you. Right? The, the 600 milligram dose is just too small for them. Right? And, and do you think that if we if we really got people on rock solid therapeutic doses at the beginning? We could even shorten our treatment time period. Well, right now we're talking 88% at 12 months. That's what the CDC data tell us, right? So when you hear 98% or 96% or 95% at six months, that sort of 
paraphrasing per protocol studies from the 1970s. It's not reality in the United States or any other country right now. It's just, it's hypothetically possible, but we're not actually achieving it in our patients. There's lots of reasons why serum concentrations are one. You know, size of lesions, extent of disease, poor immune function. There's lots of reasons why people don't do well on therapy, but most of those are baked in when you get them, right? If they have an immune system that doesn't handle TB, you're stuck with it. You can't do an immune system transplant. If they're HIV positive, you can put them on uh, CART or HART, whatever the appropriate term is now. Um, but you can put them on antiretroviral therapy and, and stabilize them, but they still have the TB, and they're probably going to have drug-drug interactions. Um, anyway, I think the only thing that matters is the exposure of the organism to the drug. And right now, we all make the assumption that that's happening splendidly in all of our patients because we're giving the dose, right? And I think I've shown you enough data, and there's plenty more to read about, that that is not true. And again, that Susan Dorman paper that uh, was made available or will be on the web page, read that paper. Because at the end of that clinical trial, knowing the dose, and there were three of them in that study, made no difference as far as predicting the outcome. But knowing that AUC to MIC made, or just the AUC in general, made all of the difference in predicting who was going to do well in that study. Louise, go ahead. Um, so I'm going to try and be brave and play devil's advocate here. So don't hurt me. Okay? <laughs> um, I actually don't use drug levels a lot because what? logistically it's actually really hard to get them. It seems like it should be a simple process, but it is not. Um, you know, the lab doesn't draw it correctly, they do it the wrong time, the patient doesn't come back for the second one, you get these results, and then you have to repeat them, and then they don't make sense, like you increase the dose, but then their, their level actually goes down. I mean, all these things have happened to me. The, the, the tube gets thawed, and then they say, don't, you shouldn't really trust you, blah, 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 on and on and on. So I don't, I haven't really used them very much, and I don't feel very, sometimes I feel a little bit anxious about it, especially in my very heavy patients. But, um, you know, I haven't, I've been treating TB for almost 10 years and I've never had a treatment failure. So it just, it just feels a little bit like, uh, you know, every time we talk about doing it, it's like, oh, how much, you know, of this like torture do we want to go through? Well, it shouldn't be torture. It really shouldn't well, be torture. Well, it shouldn't be. Right. But it is. But it Are is. you working in a hospital or in a clinic, or what is your setting? Well, we're, I work in public health, but we don't. Our, our clinic isn't really run by our public health staff. It's run by the health system, mm -hmm. and um, it's hard to get. Oh, the other thing that happens is because, um, like, trying to get us like a cyclosterine level on an mm -hmm. MGR patient because cyclosterine drug level is like not something that you can order in the electronic medical record, you get a cyclosporin level back. Yeah. We get the cyclosporin sent to our lab. Yeah. yeah. Right, Even yeah. when you call them and say, I don't want a cyclosporin level, I want cyclosporin. I mean, just stuff like that happens all the time. No matter how much you try to, like, kind of um, handhold the process through. Yeah. Well, you know, it would probably be good if you had a person who is the czar of this for your area. So, I mean, that's, that's how I got hired at National Jewish, right? So they said, Chuck, we want you to set up a therapeutic drug monitoring and pharmacology program. I went down and talked with the nurses, going to set up the program. Nothing happened. So two weeks later, I rescheduled the talk, but this time I went with Jim Cook, who was the head of ID, the guy who hired me. Sat there, said the exact same thing to the nurses, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to do it now. Because Jim Cook had the hire and fire authority for the nurses on that floor, right? So you just have to have leverage. It's always about leverage, okay? But the other thing is that you, you, people can buy into the program. It's like, why are we going to do this, and how does it make sense? And then you develop an SOP. And so, you know, when I was at NJ, we had an SOP, and we had, a, and this is at the time where you could do this, we would just put a piece of tape and a piece of paper on the patient's door. And I told the nurses, I don't care when you actually give the dose. Because, you know, the nurse was all supposed, every patient is supposed to get the dose at 8 o'clock, which is physically impossible. So they would all, you know, just check given at 8 o'clock, which, of course, no patient had it at 8 o'clock, right? Except maybe one. I said, don't tell me what theoretically happened. Just tell me what actually happened. 
And then after you give the dose, two hours and six hours later, you know, just write down the time that the blood was drawn, whether it was by you or phlebotomy. Right? And that, that worked really, really well. Now, that may not attain in your particular situation if you don't have an inpatient service. Uh, but again, if you have somebody, and usually if you have pharmacists that, that work with you, they're generally more comfortable with this stuff and they might be able to help you out. So um, at any rate, it's, it's actually, you know, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket surgery. Uh, all it is is just getting two chem panels that are timed after a timed dose. And it's got to go to the lab, centrifuge, and freeze. Um, so if you break it into its individual steps, it's not, actually not that hard. But yeah, I've heard your story and others like it many, many times. And people get frustrated and then they don't do it. Um, and then you know, people say, well, I've generally treated TB patients and I've generally done all right. And that's overall true in the United States. But the CDC data shows that we're dragging the therapy out you know, twice as long as it needs to be. And, and there's reasons for that. So I'd be encouraging, encouraging. And we can send you SOPs, OK? And you just have to find the right person who's willing to take it on as their sort of personal mission in life to make it happen. Right? But you have to have that right person who's going to do it. Yeah, and I'd be, I'd be happy to increase the dose of rifampin on my patients. But just to, to like have to do the, the, to check the level every time it seems like it'd be difficult to do. Um, and it, just another quick question. Is it, is it worth doing with INH since the MIC is so low for INH? Or is it more useful to do with INH is the most frequently measured drug in our laboratory. And we have a lot of people who have really, really low concentrations of isoniazid also. So uh, you know, can you treat patients with TB without therapeutic drug monitoring? Of course you can, right? Um, the, the analogy that I like the best is like, okay, what do we do before toilet paper? Okay, and you hear anybody clamoring to go back to corn cobs? I don't think so, right? You know, so you know, once people get used to having the newer technology, right? <laughs> We're taking people, this. <laughs> people don't want to go back. Okay, so for the labs to get used to doing therapeutic drug monitoring. Now they say, I don't know how we did it before, right? So again, you have to figure out for your own work situation what's going to work best for you. But the bottom line is that you're either guessing that you're giving the right dose or you're checking that you are. And those are your two choices. And, and then you have to live with whatever decision you make. Let's, um, let's get to the two folks who are up, and then we'll get on to Paul. And um, uh, if we end a little bit early, um, we can have some more open questions because we're not letting him hop on the plane till you know you guys get your due. Go right ahead. Cameron Kaiser, Riverside. I want to thank you for the mental image of the corn cobs. That was awful. There you go. Um, <laughs> and actually, for the most entertaining pharmacology lecture since I know a lot of us suffered under that in under med school. So, uh, so <laughs> thank you. For that. Um, that and we are trying to in Riverside definitely trying to use more uh, doses and, of rifampin on our patients and try and get more of that comfort level with higher doses and we've had some limited success but you know clinical habits die hard but one of the, to sort of attack on what Louise was saying our our problem is a little bit different we actually do run the TV clinical program in our county our problem is is when we try to send these things out we have to usually send them to National Jewish and it takes forever to get them back. But meanwhile, we have, you know, we have to make clinical decisions in the meantime. And my question was more of a general one is, what are we doing to try and get, if, if we want to use these more, and I think that we should, what are we doing as far as getting them more available at more laboratories so we can get this faster turnaround? We need to make those kind of decisions. Yeah, um, I can't speak to the TDM turnaround times at NJ because I've been gone to Florida for eight years now. So, I mean, you'd have to take that up with them. Um, I don't know but, if you but have. But if we could do them at Quest or LabCorp, well, Quest is not. Well, lab, so most of the super labs send out to either NJ or to my lab, or you know Mayo. You, you have a choice. If you go to Mayo, they'll tell you. They'll ask which one do you want it to go to. Um, you know, our turnaround time is seven days. I can't tell you what it is at, in Denver, but our turnaround is, is seven days. But most of the like the RIPE, we run that twice a week. So you should have the, the results within 72 hours of our receipt of the two. Right now, before that, I can't. If it sits in your lab for a week, I can't do anything about that. Um, so it shouldn't take that long. I mean, the problem is. So right now, we've moved, you know, from HPLC, UV, and fluorescence and electrochemical to um, HPLC with triple quadrupole mass spectrometers. One triple quad is a quarter million dollars. 
right? So a lot of labs are not going to tie up that kind of equipment for a disease that they don't consider to be profitable. Our lab is a not-for-profit laboratory. We, we play as we get paid, basically, right? Um, and, you know, the big, big labs are, are, you know, on NASDAQ or on, you know, their, their investment firms like LabCorp and Quest, those are for-profit companies. Uh, and, and they don't, they're not interested in these little niche markets because there's nothing there for them. You know, I'm just kind of stupid that way, and I just got, you know, interested in tuberculosis and then started seeing that we could make differences both in research and in clinical practice, and so we use this as a tool. Um, so, you know, if your your organization wants to, you know, work with us, we're happy to do that. Uh, if you continue to work with NJ, that's fine. You just have to work out, you know, turnaround times with them. Thank you. Hey, Tom, you were up for a while there. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, how much uh, uh, variation is there in absorption within a patient from day to day or week to week? Because sometimes when, when I do check drug levels, it seems like I start chasing numbers and it doesn't make sense. I'm going up, I'm going down. How often do you have to check well, uh, drug levels? Weekly, monthly, daily? I, I don't know. There, there's no, uh, you know definitive answer to that. I think, you know, the checking early makes sense from the standpoint that, you know, you want to get them on the right therapy as quickly as possible. And then you don't want to sort of dribble in drugs and select out for drug resistance, which you certainly can do with rifibutin. And rifibutin is the poster child for, for TDM, if I may suggest that. As far as intra-subject variability, there tends to be less of that than inter-subject variability. The inter-subject variability for rifampin is about 40-fold. Um, within a given patient, though, we're giving oral drugs and we're only getting two samples, typically. So you can miss the peak, you know, especially these are drugs that are affected by food. So if the patient didn't eat one time and then had a Big Mac the next time, they're going to have delayed gastric emptying, and so things are going to move around. I wouldn't get too hung up on that. Um, you know, it's annoying, but the bottom line is that, you know, if you're going to see grossly low values or values that are kind of close to where you want them, this is the grossly ones, low ones that I'd be most concerned about. Right. I'm going to let you sneak one more in, and then... I was going to ask, because we have, um, our patients are usually outpatient, and so if we send them to the lab, like they took their meds and they did a two-hour test one day, and then did a six-hour test another day, would that be an issue? Uh, it's suboptimal, all right? So normally, you know, if you can, if there's some kind of an incentivizer where they can come into the clinic and then they get like a, a token for lunch or whatever, so they get their, their two-hour blood draw and then they can go get something to eat and then they come back and get their six-hour you know, every clinic that I've worked with, they end up working out some kind of deal with their patients to do this. Some states, they have the visiting nurses that go out to the patient's house twice in one day. Normally, it you don't. Be the same day. It, it's best because you're trying to look at that concentration versus time curve, like you see there. You're basically picking two points off of that. And if you have two different days, you have two different dosing events, and, you know, two different things could have happened. So it'll be less confusing if you do it after a single dose. And I just had one other question um, about eating before they take their meds. Uh -huh. uh, Is for that the, a big deal? Because sometimes you know we don't want them to throw them up. Right. Uh, for the RIPE, then you know either an empty stomach or a light snack is best. Not a heavy meal, not like a Big Mac or you know a breakfast burrito. That would be bad. But you know if they want to have a little bit of cereal or a toast or something like that, it's probably not going to make any difference. How long after a meal? Well, you know, uh, it, that... Because we do the, dot, like, at 11 o'clock or, at, you know, at different times. During the day. You know, in a perfect world, you know, they would, you know, maybe have breakfast at 6 in the morning, they'd get their meds at 9 a.m., and then they get their blood draws after that, and then life would go on. Uh, some people, you know, every patient, uh, you know, I've seen lots of patients with lots of habits. So um, I would say, again, either on an empty stomach for the first-line TB drugs or with a light snack. And sometimes with coaching, you know, you just, you know, Marion Goble, whom I work with at National Jewish, like the Mother Teresa 
of, of tuberculosis care. And she would sit with the patients and she would talk them through PAS and cycloserine and ethionamide and they would take it because they didn't want to disappoint her, right? Uh, so she was amazing. And then some of it is just, you know, the sort of the, the hand-holding, basically, and making the patient feel comfortable that you really do care about them and this is your best advice and you're giving it just to them, right? <laughs> All right. Well, he'll be around for questions, but thank you so much.